Well, we can go back to that uh, Russian missile strike on the Ukrainian military base near the border with Poland yesterday. Poland says the strike was highly provocative and an attempt to threaten NATO. 35 people were killed in the strike. We can talk to Dr. Peter Kadic adams He's a war professor and NATO historian and the director of the international think tank, the Defence and International Security Institute. And he joins us from Novigrad in Croatia. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Do you see this as an escalation? Poland and certainly a lot of countries would interpret it uh, as an escalation. But this works on two levels. It's a tactical strike using cruise missiles by Russia to interrupt the flow of supply of all those anti-tank weapons and anti-aircraft missiles that are coming from the West into Ukraine. Um, and that's one of the bases where NATO personnel were training Ukrainian troops before the war began. So it makes perfect sense for the Russians to assume that that's where some of these weapons are coming into uh, and being stockpiled. So it's, it's a tactical uh, strike in that sense. But strategically, this is 15 miles from the Polish border. It would make the Polish uh, extremely uh, nervous. Um, and clearly, this is Russia sailing very close to the wind. They've got nothing to lose. Um, and uh, the, it will make a lot of the NATO allies extremely uh, concerned. But this is just another notch up on a long list of, uh, of notches of uh, the Russian Federation's tactics, all of which really are different forms of terror. Another um, issue that was raised by a Ukrainian MP who I spoke to earlier, Lesya Vasilenko, uh, when she was talking about the escalation, and she said that, Real attention needs to be paid to what happened in Croatia, which is where you're speaking to us from, where a Russian drone went down, having passed over Romania and Hungary, and Croatian officials are criticising NATO for what they say has been a slow reaction to that military drone that apparently flew all the way from the war zone in Ukraine over those NATO member states before crashing in a in a urban zone of the Croatian capital, but no one was injured. How seriously would you take that in terms of, I suppose, the indication of what could happen that could then bring NATO into the conflict? OK, well, on its own, it's not significant. The drone was a very old one. We don't know who fired it, probably Russia, and it crashed in an uninhabited area when it ran out of fuel. Mm -hmm. But it does underline the point that this conflict is almost impossible to contain. Now, the EU, UN and NATO policy is containment uh, because they and this is why there's enormous objection to a no fly zone, because it, it's impossible then to predict where this would go if other countries are involved directly uh, in the fighting. Um, you're out of the playbook. Uh, this is clearly the biggest crisis since the Second World War. Um, it's the biggest military mission the Russians have ever undertaken since 1945. Uh, and uh, we're out of any kind of scenarios that have been thought about or comp contemplated in, in recent years. Uh, and that's the worry. The, um, the possibility of military overspill into neighbouring countries uh, is very, very high indeed. Uh, and... To a certain extent, other countries are already being involved with taking refugees. That's very much to Russia's advantage. Putin is weaponizing civilians fleeing in terror just as much as they are being targeted in their tower blocks or in their uh, hospitals. Um, but the point is, all the time, we are moving closer to some kind of military overspill, which everybody is very, very nervous about, but almost impossible to prevent. Mm -hmm. So what then... Do you think of that policy of containment in terms of whether NATO could or should get involved now, which is obviously what Ukraine wants to happen? Yes, I mean, NATO won't get involved in the short term. Um, one can look at this as a way of buying time while NATO puts together a policy of what it might do uh, and, uh, and, their, and which nations of the NATO alliance uh, would be involved initially. And I'm sure that that's what's going on, the what-if scenarios. 
Um, but there's a huge reluctance to preempt this by uh, NATO getting involved first. I mean, Russia knows what the, the boundaries are in terms of the NATO Articles of Association, Article 5, uh, an attack on one country is an attack on all. It all depends how you define uh, an attack. Um, it, it does include cyber warfare now, um, but how, how do you actually define that? Is that, um, I mean, we had an American journalist who was killed the other day. He wasn't associated with the military, but if you have third party nationals who start to be killed in Ukraine, um, and what about foreign volunteers who are in uniform from other countries? Uh, it starts to get very, very murky indeed. Uh, and there will, come a, there will come a point, and it may be with weapon use, chemical weapons or worse, uh, that NATO may draw a line. But uh, NATO is being very tight-lipped about this um, because of the history of previous red lines, and I'm thinking Syria. The moment you say something and you're not prepared to back it up, uh, then you're giving support to the other side. So there's probably a bit of um, negotiation behind the scenes amongst all the NATO partners uh, of exactly what they're prepared to do and, and when and if. Dr. Peter Caddick-Adams, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.